Well, we hope you found that educational and entertaining. Now, some of 14 months ago, because of Melissa Mark Viverito's position on critical issues facing the city council, such as expanding the right to paid sick days to all workers, a minimum wage pegged to the city's cost of living, and measures that address unscrupulous landlords and promote affordable housing, and just as important because of her political savvy, her city council colleagues voted 51 to zero, that would be unanimously, to give her the leadership role. Just a little over a year later, after many bills and much progress, we get the chance to hear from the speaker herself about what she feels has been accomplished so far and just what's in store for the next three years, maybe even a little bit beyond. With that, we want to welcome, for the first time, City Councilwoman and Speaker of the New York City Council, Ms. Melissa Mark Viverito. Thank you for being here so much. Thank you for the invitation. I absolutely loved that. That was very educational, and I would love to see if we can access that ourselves in the I council. I think that we can arrange a little <laughs> something at the table. So, uh, you know, that in keeping with the way that the times are changing and letting people know exactly what's happening, we commissioned that. And you are very down with technology. We know that you're one of the most active Twitterers in all of the local government. So just to start this off right, I'm gonna ask you to whip out your phone now. Do you have it on you? Oh no, I left it outside today. You don't have today. your phone on I you. Just, no, I was okay, <laughs> hold on. They yell at me every day to cut off my phone and we usually tell the guests to, so I'm just gonna steal the first 30 seconds from this interview and tweet out the fact that you are in the building. So hold on, I'm sorry. This is wasting valuable airtime. But while my uh, phone is loading here, here we go. I'm just gonna hop out of my seat. We're gonna do a little Twitter moment. Sorry, oh, please, Ellen. let's do that. I did that at my Sorry, state of the Ellen. city, so hey, it's right. always it's, valuable. It's, it's tradition now, so yes. here we go. Just to uh, get a little pick in there, same shameless self-promotion with me and the speaker. Oh, ooh, BK Live is even there. My boss is like that when that happens. Oh, here we go. So embarrassed. I'm a real journalist. One, two. There we go. Okay. Now. We'll send that out. Yes. To the interview. Let's start with the Hillary question to get it all out of the way. Every time I see certain members of the city government, it seems like they're delivering a stump speech. So it's a pretty crowded field already. Our mayor has at least three more years. Are you going to run for mayor? Uh, no, I'm very committed to the, the speakership, obviously. And I am term limited yeah. once I leave office. And as I've said, you know, I always keep the doors open. Right. Definitely, we'll look at the future, but I'm not committed to having to jump into another political seat after I leave office. I think yeah. there's a lot of ways that you can contribute to New York City, and you can contribute to making this a wonderful and better city for all. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an elected office. Right. So I am going to really commit myself in these next uh, two and a half years to really making this council work on behalf of every single New Yorker yeah. the way we've done so far. And and then we'll see what the future lies for me in the future. 
what lies in the future for me after so that. So beyond mayor, there, of course, is the wrangle seat. But we were talking last week about the unique position that you're in, like what Mayor Bloomberg has done for gun control. You have been an outspoken voice for immigration yes. and lots of issues that are rightfully so, and partly because of you, rising to the level of national discourse. So, you know, you could leave city uh, council and be on the national level. Is that something you would be interested in? Well, definitely what we've done on behalf of immigrant New Yorkers, and yeah. this is a, an issue that is beyond the Latino community, sure. um, you know, is it, very, very important. We unfortunately have such stagnation uh, and it's an embarrassment, to be honest, what's happening at the congressional level. Right. Uh, unfortunately, we have great reps for New York City, but the Republicans are really uh, making things very difficult for progress to be achieved. We've done what we can in New York City to say this is a city that continues to welcome immigrants. We've passed legislation, right. we've implemented policies, and that has put us somewhat in a national stage because people want to emulate, to some extent, what we are doing here. Right. And I'm glad that that's happening. I'm also, because of the, my position, being the first Latina, the first Puerto Rican in, a posi in this position, right. um, I know that there is an interest in my becoming very active and helping in whatever way to mobilize the Latino community and the Latino vote for the next presidential election. And I'm definitely going to lend my voice to that. So um, New York City is where my commitment is at. This council is where my commitment is at uh, until my term is up and really excited about the work that lies ahead for us. So that explainer music uh, just showed a little bit about what your official job capacities and just how you arrive as a speaker. So you are, without a doubt, the highest ranking Latino woman in New York City political history, but it's a position that you arrived at because your colleagues put you there. Yes. Why hasn't the city collectively elevated someone from the community Community to have a citywide office. Well, that's uh, that's always a challenge, right? Communities of color, you know, need to organize and need to get out there, and and sometimes there are other barriers that exist for yeah. us making those achievements. That's why having a Letitia James in a position as the first African American woman in a citywide right. position is so critical. Myself having broken a barrier and being in this position, the more we continue to chip away at those barriers, then we really make it much more of a possibility that we can achieve even higher. You know, why not? Yes, a, a, a Latina or a Latino or an African American man. Mayor, although we've had one, we could have another one, right. or a senator, you know, or in the future, or whatever it is that we want to achieve, uh, the, the ability for us to get past some of these initial barriers is a way of getting to that point. So I'm glad that I'm able to contribute to that conversation and to that energy, and hopefully we can galvanize and continue to ensure that our voice gets heard, not only when it comes to elected office, but in terms of how we shape public policy, mm -hmm. which eventually impacts our communities. That's what my being in office is all about. That's why I've committed myself to this position. So speaking of the position and your level of commitment, it's been demonstrated clear before you became an elected. You were an activist. You were yes. in the trenches from Puerto Rico to uh, up in Harlem. So you have had the scale and we've been watching your development. So I wonder how you reconciled that split. I know Charles Barron used to be fond of saying he was an elected activist. So I wondered if you had to judge what percentage wise, how much of you is still elected uh, versus activists. I mean, I still consider myself an activist, right? Mm -hmm. The way I approach and view how to get things done is always making sure that we are galvanizing the base as well, right. right? In order to make any change happen or in order to implement any sort of change and making sure laws pass is a way of implementing change to some effect, we have to have the conversation and continue to engage our constituents because they can't be left out of the conversation, right? Um, that's why I'm very committed to figuring out how we can create tools that is gonna engage our constituencies more this inform infomercial, so to speak, <laughs> is a way of doing that, letting right. people know what the role of government is and how it impacts your life and that you need to have your voice heard and that when these issues are being talked about, you need to come to hearings, you need to go to meetings. You know, that kind of thing is something that we want to, I want to definitely um, encourage. So I'm always approaching this job and I continue to from an organizing perspective because the, the view people usually have of government is that we make decisions behind closed doors, right. right? Behind smoke and mirrors and all that stuff. And and we want to, some of us, really want to demystify government. And it's about inclusion. It's about getting people in there. And we're not going to agree all the time. Right. You know, I know that I get criticized, fine. But at least I'm listening to the voices and that's part of the conversation and we're engaging in dialogue. That's what government needs to be encouraging. And that's what our role as council members is, what our role is. 
When was the last time you disagreed with the mayor? We've disagreed on various issues. I mean, like right now, we're engaging in the budget conversation again. Right. We're having budget hearings. Last year, this year, and it's, I know it's controversial with a lot of our communities, yeah. is the issue of increasing police headcount, right. right? That continues to be a conversation that we support. The mayor hasn't really come out and embraced that. Um, we've done other issues that we may have been at odds initially, mm -hmm. and we've presented our point of view, and that we may get to a point of agreement later on. Uh, we're going to start engaging in a lot of conversations around development in our communities. Yeah. There's rezonings happening. Uh, there's economic development projects that some communities feel exacerbates gentrification. Right. Those are very, com very difficult and complicated conversations. And in that, you know, we're going to probably at some points have points of difference with the administration. But, you know, we at some point have to arrive at some point of consensus and hopefully we can get there. So in your capacity as speaker, you march into that city council chamber. And I wonder how you balance the needs of your constituents versus drawing a road map for the city, because you have to look at these plans and take them as a whole. But you represent a very specific and unique section of the city that has so many issues as we sit here in Brooklyn yeah. that mirror, you know, the same thing that happens here. So I wonder how do you balance that? It's it's hard, right? But it's important. Let me let me say not only am I only the first Latina and Puerto Rican in this position, but my district, mm -hmm. which is East Harlem, El Barrio, and the South Bronx, um, is unfortunately yeah. the second poorest in the city of New York out of the 51 council districts. Right. That lends a perspective and a point of view that has never been seen in this position, right. right? Someone with that perspective of representing a district with those challenges, which we need to overcome. Uh, but it really helps inform and make me uh, a much better, uh, you know, um, representative because of that reality. And we have to strive to break that cha those barriers and make it a thriving community. That's what my goal is. So, you know, it, it is also about having a longer term vision. Mm -hmm. There's the immediate very real needs that my constituents have. A lot come to our office because landlords are trying to price them out. Right. You've got seniors that are very vulnerable, people in public housing that are living in adverse conditions. You know, we got to demand uh, improvements to their living conditions. That's immediate. But we also have to think about long term, right. you know, and some of these decisions that we're making is having a longer term vision, which sometimes, you know, people have a hard time reconciling. Yeah. And sometimes that puts me and may put me at odds with my with constituents. But it's about, you know, taking sometimes positions that you feel strongly about or, you know, and, and based on information that you have, and you try to figure out the best way to balance that. Well, that's my favorite working definition of leadership, making <laughs> those tough decisions that yes. might not be apparent. But knowing that you do uh, have a mandate to represent the people from that uh, second lowest, uh, the highest poverty rate in the districts for the whole city, who makes your job tougher? It seems if a person is leading the city council and they come from one of the poorest districts in the city, instead of sort of this idea some people might have of a crony network where we're all running the city. If a person comes from the second poorest district and all of a sudden they're running the city council, who's on the other side? Are there barriers to your job knowing you didn't have like the silver spoon constituency? No, I mean, I think that that just makes me a better representative because you are, you know, living uh, that, that experience with your constituents, right? right? And so th those challenges that come in the, in the, in the challenge and the, the struggles of everyday constituents coming through the door and what, th what their needs are. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it has been really, really, uh, you know, incredible to represent my constituents. And that's what keeps me grounded in the work that I do, that every day when I walk my community, you know, that people can talk to me and tell me what their ch challenges are. You know, I represent the most public housing in the city of New York, mm -hmm. and that has become a real priority for me. And then figure out how we make the council responsive to those needs. And um, that is why I believe in that vision that the mayor has laid out overall in terms right. of really creating opportunities for everyone about equity and justice, because that belongs to all of us. Just because I have constituents that are working poor um, doesn't mean that their voice is any less important to listen to mm -hmm. than maybe those that live in the wealthiest district and in, this the, is in the city. In the backdrop of knowing that more money was pumped into this last election cycle at a mm -hmm. crazy rate by outside interest, and we have real estate lobbies and developers getting involved in 
low, not low levels, but in levels where they're typically not associated. We think of all of this money in, like Congress, in Congress, and, and right. but it's slowly making right. its way, and not even slowly, the money's here. So how is that affecting the job and the day-to-day, -day, this influence of money coming in? No, that's a real, that's a real problem, I mm -hmm. believe, uh, that we need to be able to know who is yeah. funding these campaigns. Um, there's been some uh, movement on trying to get greater disclosure, that it shouldn't be that you can throw your money behind an anonymous pack right. and not be able to divulge who it is that you're supporting or what your agenda is, right? Yeah. We need more clarity and transparency, but there also, also should be limitations. Mm -hmm. That's why we have a campaign finance program in the city of New York. We would love to see something like that at the state level. We would like to see other cities implementing it because it does although not completely, right. it does help candidates um, really get run a viable campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you're extremely wealthy, like Bloomberg was, you yeah. don't participate Take in the, the program, you can pump in as much money as you want. Still, you know, in order to give you some matching funds, um, it will help candidates be able to be viable, particularly those that represent communities that's who's, who have been more marginalized in this city. It's important to have candidates who, um, who understand that and who have a very varied background representing this city council and this city. And that's what it's about. Um, out of the 51 members, at least we are incredibly diverse. We have 27 yeah. that are members of color representing the Asian American community, representing African Americans and Latinos, uh, which reflects the reality of New York City. Yeah. And we need to see that at other levels of government too. So you spoke about those representatives and this power of uh, representation and even just the optics on the whole thing, making the city council look like the city where people are living and working and being here. So I wonder about some of the young rising political stars who may be Latino or Asian American, and if you think that uh, power of representation or the politics of representation are at place in New York City, how important that is to have the city council look like I think it's incredibly important. That's why, you know, when we had the conversation about um, having Sonia, Sonia Sotomayor be a rep on the Supreme Court, that's why I felt so strongly, and others did too, that we needed the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which is making, you know, these decisions be reflective, you know, the reality of this country. Um, and those voices and those experiences need to be at the decision-making table. The beauty of, and some people don't like term limits, yeah. but I think some aspect of the beauty of term limits is that you do create a revolving door where you do have to be encouraged to develop and nurture new leadership mm -hmm. to run for these positions, right? When you have positions which you can be there for 30, 40, 50 years, you're not really encouraged to develop leadership. And yeah. uh, that's one of the aspects of it, you know? And, and so we are seeing a much younger, energized, um, varied experience uh, uh, members Sorry, coming into the council. Your tweet coming through. <laughs> People are liking the pick. Um, you know, so, so that's one of the aspects of it. And I'm committed to that. I believe in leadership development overall. Uh, one of the sad realities in the New York City Council is that out of 51 members, only 15 are women. Mm -hmm. And in the next cycle, we actually may lose more women if we don't have women running for office. And we need more women yeah. <laughs> to run for office uh, because our seat, seats are becoming available. But we need to create the opportunities for development so that we have a crop of candidates you know, ready to go. And, and that's what I'm committed to. So uh, speaking about the position of women, we had the Paid Sick Leave Act that yes. affects every New Yorker and maybe even uh, women disproportionately, specifically those who head their households. And we are in a place where right now where what the woman at the Oscars famously said, women aren't making as much money. Right. Women are being told to lean in. They're not making as much money, yet we still sit in a state where the women's equality agenda hasn't, hasn't passed. been passed mm -hmm. yet. So how are we doing as a city? What Where is there room for improvement to help the lives I mean, of women? I we, mean, we do what we can, right? Sometimes we as a city are handcuffed because yeah we may need state authorization for certain things. So the, for instance, the conversation we've been having about increasing the minimum, minimum wage. wage. Yeah. We can't do that unilaterally as a city council, That's right. as much as we wish we could. And mm -hmm. we've been asking you know, that, the, that the state consider that. Uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't look likely that we need to be able to, uh, we can discuss and debate 
as a city what we feel is the right thing uh, and right wage and, and do that. Right now we can't do that. So that, that would be something that would help elevate people's salaries and women in particular be able right, to, right. to provide for, their, for themselves and their families. And so those are some of the challenges we have as a municipality is there are times we want to be able to do certain things but we may not be able to because the state has oversight over that. We were able to do the paid sick leave. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one example. Uh, the mayor last year did a prevailing wage um, action that right. any economic development project that gets certain city subsidies would have I to pay a that. prevailing wage. So there's the things that we can work on, we're looking, willing to explore and figure out how we move those forward. Uh, and in the case where we can, then we need to galvanize and organize and ask that that consideration be given to us from the state. Well, we're really happy that you came here today. I've spent the last week reading about you, looking for videos, <laughs> delving into all this. I know about your dad's optometry and you Enough helping folks out that. there. So why don't you do these things more often? There was hardly any videos of you doing sit down, so we're lucky. Oh, I'm but doing why more are you? You're doing more and more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so no, we'll I, the door. I am. I'm, you know, my job is really to work with my colleagues mm -hmm. and to support them in, in do the, the work that they are doing in their con for their constituents, and then also trying to you know bring together the council on a common agenda that we can move forward legislation, negotiating the budget with the mayor, and hearing from from constituents across the city. And yes, I, I go out there as often as I can, uh, and and really so, you know, speak on behalf of the council and, and the work that we're trying to do. I'm working on it more and more, but well, <laughs> invite me again. I'll be back. Okay, write that down. She's coming <laughs> back. So what's the most annoying question that people ask you when you come out? Because I had a whole list of questions. I'm like, oh, no, I can't ask that. But what what is the I sort mean, of real It's not like, annoying. She's but, the first Puerto Rican. Yeah. She's a woman. Woman Puerto Rican. What is No, what the, the question I get a lot of them is, is, like, is it as hard as you thought it was going to be? That kind of, you know, question, which I'm like. It's a job. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's you know, being having been in the council for eight years, yeah. you know, you know what the role of the speaker is. Yeah. Um, you have your own leadership style. You mm -hmm. have your own goals and vision that you want to accomplish, and right. that's what we're fulfilling. We're trying to make this council more democratic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making making empowering the members, yeah. and and really giving more opportunities for our constituents to engage with this level of government. So website being more interactive, yeah. um, trying to get out there and let people know that they can talk to us. Right. And so we're creating those mechanisms, and it's very been very exciting so far, and mm -hmm. much more is in store. So watch for it. Okay, what is in store? A little bit of a preview. We've got about ninety seconds left. No, no, I mean, one of the things is, is one of the aspects is the technology front gotcha. is how do we make the council much more, you know, we want to do more um, hearings in the communities. Mm -hmm. We want to be more engaged in the communities. Uh, we've expanded participatory budgeting, which is something I'm very proud of, right. uh, with support of the council to 24 districts where constituents are voting on projects that they consider priorities, yeah. where they would like funding to be. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing some really good work, and on that vein is where we're going to continue, is to continue to make this uh, a, a, like a two-way street with gotcha. our constituents. Right. We're very much about empowering those that we represent. So home rule for MTA? Well, MTA is a whole other story. We could be here for years talking about the MTA, but unfortunately, we have very limited authority over that. Okay, so what about uh, rent regulations? I know that was well, something you guys yes, just got done. Yes, yes. We want to strengthen the rent regulations laws that exist, that are, about, that are potentially going to expire at the yeah. state level. We need them renewed. But then here we have the rent control, uh, the rent guidelines board, which um, we need to be more favorable towards tenants. So there's going to be that level of activism and engagement. What do you think of that last appointment to the board? He's a the developer guy. Well, the problem is that the board in reality does, you know, you do have to have the art developer or, you know, real estate. Some balance. Yeah, there's real estate representatives. There are tenant representatives. Right. There's there's slots for different um, individuals. So that was a slot that had to be filled for that sector. There's been some great appointments the mayor has made on the tenant side, mm -hmm. people that are very much um, favorable towards tenants. And then we had a, you know, we had a decision last year yeah. that was the lowest increase that we had seen in the history of the rent guidelines board. So hopefully that's an indication that we're on a better path. So speaking of the path, just to wrap up, what is the biggest Hail Mary that you anticipate introducing this year? What's the one that you're just going to have to hold its hand and walk all the way through the approval process? Well, I mean, there's there's everything I do is in deep consultation with my colleagues. Okay. So there's a lot of legislation, a lot of mm -hmm. legislation that is being discussed. And so we're in the Drop process. Drop an exclusive No, I right can't do that. Can't do that. <laughs> but thank you so much. Okay, we appreciate you coming by, and we look forward to your next visit. Thank yes, you for doing this. thank you for the invitation. I'll see you in the Twitterverse. Yes, you will.